is the world's number one largest growing economy thanks to its GDP growing at 7%. Keeping with this positive market sentiment, the Emerging India Forum 2017 is a platform to discuss the unique investment opportunities presented by Indo-Singapore Bilateral Trade. We bring you the key highlights from the thought-provoking deliberations. The world, as you know, is a lot more volatile now there's a lot more uncertainty now. But as Warren Buffett recently said, the world is indeed uncertain, but therein lies the opportunity. So what are the opportunities that we are seeking now to discover? India is the next emerging investment destination being discussed all over the world. And to understand what this opportunity is, we have got an eminent panel today. But before we begin, I want to take you through a very quick brief profile of the Times Network. Uh, the Times Network, as you know, is India's largest, is a part of India's largest media conglomerate, the Times of India Group. We print the world's largest English newspaper called the Times of India, 13 million copies every day. USA Today is 5 million and the Sun is under 5 million. We also have a bunch of uh, television channels. Uh, we have uh, India's largest radio station network. Uh, we have an online business which has 900 million page views. Uh, we produce some movies, we have some music. Uh, and uh, our television network is now present in about 100 countries around the world. Uh, we very recently launched in Western Europe, taking the count to 102, so we cover five continents and 100 countries. Times now is a flagship channel that is present, like I said, in about 100 countries, and it's present in Singapore on uh, Singtel uh, TV. It has been the number one channel since 2008. It has been India's largest English news channel. Uh, we have uh, had a change of anchor. Our lead anchor has changed, but we still continue to be the number one channel. We have 40% of dominance in the English news space in India. Uh, we have three times more than the nearest competitor. So, and, and if you look at our coverage of the UP elections recently, uh, we were 59% of the market share when we covered the UP elections and broadcast them on Times Now. We were the single largest channel uh, on which India watched the UP election results unfold. Uh, we are also the largest brand on Twitter, the largest news broadcasting brand on Twitter, largest broadcasting brand on Twitter, and we are a partner of Twitter for everything that we do because Twitter believes we drive and build a lot of conversations in the country. Uh, and we are available, like I said, in Singtel. Uh, and our constant, uh, constant endeavor is to build platforms across the world which can bring the diaspora and the local communities and engage them with India. So whether it's States India or whether it is the opportunities of different, uh, you know, sorts that the uh, that the government presents, uh, we engage with different diaspora worldwide to build them together to the world. That brings me to the uh, Emerging India Forum 2017. We have a very interesting theme. I think, uh, you know, a very bold move of demonetization was unleashed by the Honorable Prime Minister in December, and that led to a rapid adaption of the digital economy in India. And I think that is, uh, you know, one of the driving themes uh, of today. Uh, we also have uh, big, bold themes like Make in India uh, and Smart Cities going to the next uh, level in India. And we hope that our panel today will unravel some of these uh, opportunities. So in last 12 months, the perception and confidence in India has improved tremendously and also could be validated by all the macroeconomic indicators. The recent elections in India across five states has further raised expectation from Indian government around legislative reforms and its execution. We, from a DBS perspective, see India on a very stable track for achieving GDP growth rate of more than 7% per annum, stable inflation, stable external debt at about $485 billion. This all puts together India on a very solid footing to face any global uncertainty. Lower interest rate and stable currency has attracted foreign investments in India. In fact, India has become a top 10 FTI destination globally, 
with FDI in excess of $40 billion per annum. Now to put today's event in the perspective, Singapore is a leading financial center for channelizing all the investments in India. In fact, Singapore is India's sixth largest trading partner and has significant stakeholders for growth in India and investments in India. I've listed down some key investors from Singapore who have invested in India over the years. These investments are mainly in infrastructure and banking sector. To name few, starting with DBS Bank, it's the fourth largest foreign bank in India, present in India for more than 20 years with 12 branch network. The total asset for India is about close to $6.11 billion. SEMCOP, it has a significant portfolio of power assets in India across six states. And then PSA, it operates five container terminal. And last but not the least, Hyflux. It opened its largest membrane-based recycling plant in Gujarat. Now if you look at the 100 Smart City Initiative which was run by Government of India, there are already two Singapore-based companies, Jurong Consultants and Sabana International, which are already working in India, in Andhra Pradesh and in Mumbai metropolitan region. I think we are at a very fortuitous and opportune time in respect of short-term cyclical uh, uh, momentum. I think the world is actually in a good place. A lot of people talk about the effect of Trump. I actually, uh, for good or bad reason, wrote a LinkedIn blog the day before Trump's inauguration, uh, the subject of which was that I didn't think Trump would be too bad for the world. Uh, of course, after that, I heard his inauguration speech, and I wish I hadn't written the blog. Uh, however, my basic premise still holds, and the premise is really based on the fact that there is good tailwind in the global economy. The US economy is relatively robust. I think this year, for the first time in six or seven years, it will break out of the shackles of the 2% GDP growth rate. Uh, I think there's every possibility we will see 2.5, 2.7% growth. Consumption continues to be very strong, 3% uh, uh, in the fourth quarter. Retail sales are up, including in January and in February. Consumer confidence is at a 15-year high. Uh, the payroll data is looking good. Unemployment is low. The only thing you could argue is business investment is still not very strong. Uh, that, by the way, is a truism for many countries around the world. But uh, if Trump can pull off any small smidgen of either fiscal expenditure or tax reform, I think you'll start seeing some of that business uh, investment coming in as well. India is obviously surprised on the upside. 7% growth rate in the last quarter was unexpected. People thought the impact of demonetization would be a lot more severe than it turned out to be. 10% growth in consumption. I think the after effects of a good monsoon and rural spending are showing through. Uh, but perhaps to me most interesting, I just came in this morning um, uh, from India. Uh, for the first time in many, many months, I'm beginning to sense a spirit of optimism in the Indian corporate sector. Many of our clients I met over the last week are beginning to change the tune somewhat in respect of their willingness to put money to work. And that is indeed a welcome change. So. Uh, Bottom line, I think from an overall cyclical standpoint, uh, I think the world is in a good place. And I think uh, both Singapore and India will benefit over the next 12 months uh, on the back of that. Obviously, some things can go wrong. Um, you know, trade, if there's protectionism, trade barriers, uh, it could derail a few things. My own bias is uh, the US will probably put anti-steel dumping duties on China. Well, there'll be country number 55. 54 other countries have already done that, so I'm not sure it's going to be earth shattering. Um, I think there's um, obviously geopolitical risk in Europe, but I think it could cut both ways. If it turns out that Marie Le Pen doesn't win and Angela Merkel stays in power, I think you might see a strong rebound in Europe. You might actually see a much stronger euro than people are currently anticipating. Uh, and finally, you could see a much quicker and sharper set of rate hikes coming out of the US. Uh, the market is pricing in three rate hikes this year. 
our economist thinks that you'll see eight rate hikes between now and the end of 2018, which should be a tad bit more than people expect. So that obviously would create some market volatility and perhaps some capital outflow from the region. So, so the uh, year is not without risk, uh, but on balance, I am uh, positive about where we are on the cycle. Well, uh, let me also start where, uh, where Piyush uh, has started, which is to say, you know, what does the world look like? And for people in my profession, um, that is in the world of di diplomacy, it is uh, often the case that every moment we consider to be a moment of great challenge because that justifies our existence. But in one sense, and perhaps not in an economic sense, it is not so much about the number, but about the sentiment today, which tells us that we may be truly at a moment uh, of great flux and change. There is no defining or a dominant narrative anymore in the world. There is the existing, uh, the pillars of the existing order that we have been so accustomed to for the past six decades uh, seem a bit shaken. Um, the character of the global economy is changing. The future certainly looks less familiar uh, than we had would have imagined. And it is also the fact that it's no longer economic theology in many parts of the world to champion the cause of openness and globalization. And linked to this, and it's not unimportant, and we should never underestimate the fact that there are new fault lines that are coming up within and between societies that will also cast, cast a big shadow on, uh, on the economic world. Uh, and I say this uh, because in some sense, so we see the uh, uh, optimism being generated uh, by the numbers that we spoke about, and it truly is a situation where if some of the things that we anticipate this year happen, we could be in not such a dire, in fact, in a pretty good situation. But in the longer term perspective, uh, we live in a world where there's still uncertainty about uh, uh, national behavior, and certainly of the major powers, and that casts a big shadow. But it is in this environment that we often see that the light of, um, you know, the bright light of optimism and confidence uh, is on India. And again, not just because of the numbers, but because also of the underlying trends. Of course, we've heard about the growth story. It will go up to 75 to 7.7%. Uh, agriculture is doing well. Uh, services is clipping along at a good rate. Uh, we've seen um, the manufacturing sector in India go from ninth position to the sixth position, so there is some impact of make in India already. The implementation of infrastructure, as Piyush pointed out, is nearly at a double the rate it used to be uh, until about three years ago. Uh, we have seen macroeconomic stability increase, uh, improve with uh, decline in uh, or reduction in fiscal deficit, reduction in current account deficit, uh, reduction in inflation rate, uh, revenue deficit, and certainly increase in our external reserves. The pace of reforms has quickened, and it's important to point out that it is currently, and I can see where the focus is, it is not so much on grabbing media headlines, but on improving the national bottom line. It's as much on the process as on policy, because so many times, so much of our problems lie really in the processes, and it is as much on governance reforms as it is on economic reforms. Because economic reforms as a transformational project is something that we have more or less completed. And some of the real challenges lie in governance reforms, which Piyush also, of course, alluded to, and particularly where business and government come to an interface, particularly in allocation of resources, in grants of licenses, yeah, and so on and so forth. So that has been also the focus of the budget that we saw more recently, uh, addressing the five fundamental issues. How do you accelerate growth when the private investment is anemic and there are strong external challenges? And that is through public investments, uh, through innovation efficiency, and also is in supply side constraints on infrastructure and skills. Uh, making growth more inclusive, um, and certainly improving macroeconomic stability. And also, two important aspects of the budget was the emphasis on digitalization and governance reforms. So when you see this entire process, I can assure you that there is a very strong political will backed by an equally strong and increasingly stronger political mandate and a policy environment that we can expect to remain stable and predictable for the next few years. You know, sometimes I feel 
too many changes are as good as no changes only when all the changes are complete when you have no changes in a system or in a society people learn to live with it people learn to be with it and people learn to live the way the things are and when one starts talking of changes in the society or a system everybody waits waits for the next set of changes next set of changes next set of changes and everybody wants to see a finality only when that is over then again we'll start moving that means i know all the rules of the game before i again start moving else i don't want to be caught off guard my react my experience has that been for last two and half years we had no changes and all of us were complaining you know land acquisition is difficult this is difficult doing business is difficult and suddenly we had changes and lot of things have changed in india still we are waiting we are waiting for more and more changes when the gst will be completed when this bankruptcy laws will laws will be passed when this will be passed that will be passed perhaps the finality is what people are looking for and i am sure are two and half years down the line with political uh, stability being almost certain uh, people's acceptance of being on the right side of law is now a uh, given thing in india nobody would like to be seen with the color black in the connotations of not doing things right with the blood of the system the currency being changed and everybody having a new hope in the new economy i am sure the finally the make in india will take off in a big way in the coming days and this not, no no other uh, time can be more opportune than this panel of the day saw senior economist swaminathan iyer in conversation with eminent business and thought leaders to take stock of the shifting geopolitical situation in the world and its impact on indo singapore bilateral trade let me say that within the situation india is one of the best placed countries india is the best place because our productivity is rising by leaps and bounds because we have been underachievers for so long that simply by catching up with the other countries we are able to have leaps of productivity while well, the others at the frontier can't within india the backward states are so far behind the advanced states just the backward states catching up with the advanced states huge productivity increases are possible Swami, so these are the positives so may i just stop you here and let's move on to pushan dat you are an economist and a political scientist at ncii we are talking about the india growth story and the trajectory Swami's view is that this trajectory is difficult to do the China story of seven, eight, nine, ten. It ain't going to happen because export markets are kind of closing. But how do we? I mean, without that double digit or a high growth rate, you're going to have the usual challenge of unemployed people not achieving our ambitions, whatever we want to do. So we've got an adverse geopolitical situation in terms of anti-globalization. Where do you see this growth will come from? Is it all domestic? can we make it okay so uh, you know as an economist i know that the way countries get rich is very simple you just have to grow fast for long periods of time okay for 30 years 40 years 50 years that's how you get rich that's what singapore did that's what japan did right and that's so what the growth rate today is in india whether it's 7% versus 6% i think is a less important debate the question is can we sustain these growth rates for long periods of time now what you need for for growth you essentially need you know the the first thing which swami uh, emphasized is that given where we are given how far we are from this technological frontier where let's say the us sits uh, we can simply just replicate things and you know start growing fast okay all we have to do is take people out of farms and put them into factories this is the only model of growth which has worked in the history of humanity okay now there has to be demand coming in uh, for india it, you know for china most of much of the demand came from export markets for india it can come domestically uh, what do we need to sustain this growth rate for long periods of time this is the thing which piyush was talking about in the short term what we need is simply to improve the environment for doing business okay uh, we did a little bit of reforms in the late 80s and the early 90s and we grew fast because of that again if we do a little bit of reforms today we'll be will be fine 
the, the, the real uh, question that arises is the governance issue, which the ambassador raised, okay? But that, the, the, we have to do these governance reforms much later, I think. Governance reforms are, for instance, much more important for middle-income countries like China. Even with our poor governance, if we just make it easy to do business, easy to start business, easy to close business, you know, just make our legal systems a little bit more efficient, these are things that we can do very well. At the same time, we have to recognize that we are now living in a new world. Okay? It's, a, it's a new world order because of Trump, because of Brexit, because of the rise of populist parties. Uh, what has happened is that, you know, as Swami pointed out, you know, a segment of the population has been left behind. Uh, and, these, and there's a tremendous backlash against the global economic order. If those rules change, then this will have an impact on all the countries in this region who have benefited from the global economic order. But it's also an opportunity because these countries can start thinking about that we're going to move from a unipolar world where the US dominates to more of a multipolar world. And you know there is an opportunity there for ASEAN, Singapore, uh, China, India to work together and build this multipolar world. There is one thing which makes me very uh, optimistic about India. So uh, if I contrast Singapore with India, Singapore does very well when the rules of the game are very well known and they are implemented in a rational fashion. When things are very uncertain and unpredictable, I think Indians tend to do a little bit better because we are, we are sort of very flexible. Okay? We sort of do, originated this thing called the Jugar innovation, right? Which is about you know, doing things with very limited resources. We are good when the rules are, are given, but they are taken as an opening gambit, okay? So, you know, this is like, uh, this is what is happening in Trump's world. There are certain rules, but Donald Trump wakes up, he tweets out something, and then suddenly the rules change, okay? So in this kind of world where things are less predictable, things are less certain, and, uh, you know, I think India can act, India has an opportunity to actually do well. So, in, so just to summarize, in the medium term, we essentially need to improve the environment for doing business. In the longer term, we need more governance uh, improvements. We need to build our legal system. In the very short term, with the world experiencing a lot of uncertainty, I'm still bullish on India because we sort of thrive in very uncertain environments. OK, let me just take it to Piyush. Piyush, just changing the tack a little bit. Financial sector reform banking restructuring, the whole issue of, of bankruptcy code, asset management company to take out those bad loans. It is the worst I've seen over my years in banking. This is the worst 13, 14% NPAs. No idea how to handle it. Everyone talks about it. Every new governor reserve bank has a new uh, monologue for, for this, what they're going to do. Do you see a light under the tunnel, do you see is going to happen and what, are, what will make it happen? I think uh, the answers are quite obvious. Whether we have the wherewithal, the political capacity to uh, do what it takes is less certain. And there are really only two schools, right? One school is you kick the can down the road uh, eternally. The Japanese did that all the way from the 1980s, and you had two lost decades. You kept kicking the can down the road. The Latinos did that from the 1980s up to the 2000s. You keep sort of hoping to inflate away the problem sometime in the future. Um, in my own experience, that takes a long period of time. It kills the incentive to invest, and it creates a massive, massive overhang on economic activity for an extended period of time. The other approach is the American approach, which is you bite the bullet, you take the pain, and you put it behind you and get on. The GFC was a classic example of that. The first banks in the world who took their pain were the Americans, and within two years, recapitalized, put money in, got on with life. Today, they're the best performing banks and making more money than anybody else, anybody else in the world again. So it seems to me that it's a tried and tested method. You know, you can get on and do a few things. Uh, Ravi, uh, the Singapore story, you write quite a bit on that. Is there, I mean, 1993, the India fever started in Singapore, ESM Go started it, and he has been a great supporter of that all along. Is there still an India fever, or are we taking our relationship for granted? Not much has happened, it's like steady, but 
nothing spectacular. Yeah, Both you. have so much to do, yeah. to, to give to each other. You know, after the reforms uh, that uh, Narasim Rao uh, announced in 91, uh, Chidambaram and uh, Manmohan Singh as finance minister actually flew down to explain to Singapore. You know, Singapore really had no clue about, uh, you know, or wasn't really convinced about it. And you're right. The first statement uh, from a global leader to endorse the Indian reform process was really from Mr. Gochok Tong in 94. He was going to, uh, uh, to India to be chief guest of the Republic Day Parade. And he said, I want to start a mild India fever. Now, what happened was that uh, the fever caught on in India uh, much more than uh, uh, in Singapore. Because I remember, I don't know, uh, Swami, if you were editor of the Economic Times at that time, there was an editorial in the Economic Times that said, look, send all your reserves here. This is the best place to invest. You know? You know? I mean, that was the enthusiasm with which, and as we know, you know. To I probably wrote it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, so we, today we have um, almost uh, more than 5,000 companies in, uh, uh, you know, Indian companies here. If you look at uh, air traffic uh, uh, connections, you know, I, I think 25 years ago we had 40 uh, uh, connections. Today we are more than 400. Uh, at every stage, you know, when I was covering India, I plotted this on a map. Uh, you know, infrastructure projects, you know, this uh, tech parks and all that. And I was putting red dots uh, where these Singapore parks are coming up. And it looked like India got chicken pox. You know, that was the spread. So a lot has happened that is, uh, uh, you know, that's not entirely recognized. The iconic project was the Bangalore Park. And uh, since then, we have suffered from a lack of iconic projects. And I think uh, it is time that we had another big one uh, with the kind of things that have been listed out by Piyush and by High Commissioner Ashraf. Uh, I was in Dubai uh, two weeks ago for a conference, and I heard uh, John Chambers of Cisco. He had a 15-minute presentation. Five minutes he spoke about India in that presentation. And he was really gung-ho. He said, some of the things the Indians are trying uh, has not been tried in some of the major developed countries of the world. KV, Singapore just went through a process of trying to reinvent itself. And they do this brilliantly every 10 years. And they seem to get it right and land on their feet every time they do it. And we are at a point where Singapore has just done it. And to start off, I'll encourage that we rub our eyes, change our lenses, and relook at the Singapore India corridor as to what are the new emerging opportunities. Where do you see the bright lights? Where is it going to lead up to? There are two or three thoughts that come to my mind. I take the point from Mr. Swami, but I beg to disagree a bit on the talent piece in India. Beyond bilateral trade and investment, and in both of these areas, if you start looking at numbers, they can be very tricky because Singapore always happens to be an entreport. It is re-export, re-import, and the same logic seems to prevail to some extent on investments too, which has got questioned in the recent past very substantially. I think the move forward is to see how Singapore can really benefit India, and India can benefit Singapore in its journey to recreate itself, and get into the top gear on innovation, science and technology, in going to market with innovations of all kinds, including India's huge background that we have at the bottom of the pyramid, where frugal innovation has worked very well in India. And if you look at the trend lines, 2015, something like $10 billion came from all over into India into startups. 1,800 startups, which are extremely promising and set to be become future uh, billion-dollar enterprises, have started out. I believe the trend is even more accelerated in the current year. When you look at Singapore, looking at $21 billion in the innovation space itself, I think there is a huge opportunity. The highlight of the evening was a tete-a-tete -tete with the Honourable Minister of Road Transport and Highways and Shipping, Sri Nitin Gadkari. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, thank you for giving your time uh, for this uh, event. Uh, you have had a very impressive track record. I remember you when you were in Mumbai, when you built up the, the road network in Maharashtra. 
you have done a brilliant task of 21 kilometers a day of roads that have been built. So, lots of things happening in the in your area of shipping, of uh, road transport and highways. However, for businessmen here, India still remains has issues on infrastructure. So, I thought it's a good opportunity if you can give us a, a short view of how you see infrastructure playing out in, Indi in, in India. So, over to you, sir. In infrastructure, uh, the present uh, situation in the country is very positive. And we have now a lot of investment in the road sector. At the time when I taken charge as a minister, it was come to 2 kilometers per day. But uh, within this two and a half year, now we have come, uh, come to 22 kilometers per day. And uh, the problems regarding the land acquisition, environment forest clearance, utility shifting, already government has taken special initiative for that. And today the situation is very good and it is a very positive atmosphere for investment. We have a fast track decision making process, full transparency and corruption free system. And that is the one of the reason that now uh, after when completing the three years of our government, we have already signed the contracts more than five lakhs crores in the road sector only. So the lot of investors are giving good response and I'm confident that in the next two years, we will be definitely succeed to be, we can construct more road construction in the country. So, lots of work has been done clearly as you just told us, but for investors who want to invest in roads and ports, there are still delays, payment delays, uh, delays in, 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 in land acquisitions for private investors. So, I think that issue and also the ease of doing business in India is still not, we are still 125th. All these add up to the worries foreign investors have. Would you have any comments on how we are going to resolve those? Highway sector presently we don't have any problem because our cabinet has taken 22 decision in the cabinet by which we have already changes lot of law system and procedure. We have already introduced our model agreement and uh, presently whatever the negative problems which previously were facing by the sector today with the coordination with the bankers and the contractors, the investors, we are in position to take the decision fast. So presently now for the road sector, the from response from the Indian investors and foreign investors is very good. And now we are now, we have a lot of project with us. We are planning for construction of new express highways. And uh, most important thing is, our, uh, in past our uh, uh, national highway was 96,000 kilometer. But today we have taken decision to make it 2 lakh kilometer. In the country we have the road length of 2 lakh kilometer, out of which only 96,000 kilometer was national highway. And 2% uh, of the road and 40% uh, of the country's traffic. But because we have decided to make it 2 lakh kilometer, now the 80% of traffic will be on, on national highway and we are getting good response. The, the traffic density is every time increase and I feel that automobile sector in the country is also day by day, it is also giving good positive response. So I feel that it can be really a good opportunity for the investor to invest in toll roads in India. Okay. So let me open it to the floor and we will ask uh, people to ask questions. Uh, can I take some questions which you may have for the minister? Otherwise, I have a list of questions. Okay. So, <clears throat> Minister, while everyone is thinking about questions, let me land acquisition and land reform bill. Is it going to be taken up at some stage or are we going to continue with the old existing land bill? Uh, as far as an Indian scenario, the land acquisition is a state subject. Uh, it is in a concurrent list, but uh, now we have to go by the laws with the, uh, of the state government. 
and because of the decision taken by the federal government that we are now giving very attractive compensation for the land and that is one of the reason that people are giving good response. So presently in a situation land acquisition is not a problem. In my own department for this year we will acquire land, acqu land more than the cost of 60,000 crore and uh, people are giving good response and uh, we are also need the cooperation from the state government and uh, we are on the fast track with the full transparency and presently the land acquisition is not a problem and uh, we have already taken decision that if we will uh, have at least more than 50 percent land acquired only then we can give appointment date so the now uh, previously that was 80 percent of the land acquisition for that but today we are taking decision as is 50 percent of the land for that acquisition for that and also the projects are moving fast and we are getting good response it is not a problem presently neither it is a, some, there is a perception in the mind of some people that land acquisition is a big problem but presently we don't have any problem we are moving fast The second panel had eminent speakers deliberate on matters like demonetization and implementation of GST. Given that manufacturing does not create the same number of jobs because of automation and new technologies, given that China is already the manufacturing center of the world, given that the world is going back into a deglobalized model, will make in India face these challenges and can we succeed? Having said that, I must also tell you, a year ago I wrote an article which said that given that all the OEMs are coming into India, the component manufacturers will come in, defense production will take place, and therefore manufacturing growth will come out of this. Your comments. <coughs> there is no government that has been promoted to make in India. So we have slogans rather than new policies. But briefly, don't confuse make in India with manufacture in India. Already said, uh, the fastest growing part has been services. The idea that there's something wrong with this, and oh my God, industry is getting left behind. It's an illusion. You should set yourself, how do I create the possibilities of excellence in India, in production of goods, services, agriculture, whatever, and then leave it to the market to decide when the percentages come out. Why should 25% be manufacturing? It may turn out, I mean, if you do what I'm suggesting, maybe 20, maybe 23, maybe 27. But there's no point fixing one particular percentage. Make things expand the universe of possibilities and then let the market decide where the money should go, where most of it should go. And then let's try and understand what the word make means. I give the example of Apple, where Apple was uh, making its uh, iPhones first in China and selling them for $300. Everybody said, oh my God, import from China. The value added of the $300 in China was $7. The share of Apple in design marketing was 150. So was this Apple phone made in the USA or made in China? I would say it was made in the USA, even though all the manufacturing was in China. So I mean, we need to disaggregate. So we say, you know, don't just focus on manufacturing. Say that we have to innovate in various ways, and the value addition may lie entirely in innovation, in R&D, in services of various kinds. So let's not have any one set of targets for each sector. Let us create uh, appropriate climate and then let everything rip and let the market just decide. Keep, just keeping on this theme, so Rohan, uh, if I can shift to you, tax. Big issue, I'm sure you, you struggle with it every time with your customers. GST is a game changer. We have all talked about it. You need to explain to people here how will GST impact companies which do business in India and, and various, what are the impact on that? So that's one. And the second, if I can just put the question to you, is this Mauritius Treaty, which is now the Singapore Treaty and the Mauritius Treaty, both have been uh, clearly changed. Is there an advantage to Mauritius still? Does the treaty benefit Singapore? I think both these issues, if you can quickly cover. I think two challenges, right? To cover GST in a uh, space of two minutes is itself a challenge, right? Because tax in India, as uh, His Excellency earlier alluded to, 
you know, what we need is predictability. But if you look at it from a GST perspective, it's the biggest game changer. And why do we say that? Because if you look at what the regulations were in the past, you had excise duties, you had service taxes, you had sales tax, you had VAT, all of that. And you used to levy these taxes whenever you did a transaction. But you couldn't claim a credit for some of these taxes. So you couldn't say offset, let's say, an excise duty with a service tax, which basically increased your cost to the final consumer. Now with GST coming in place, what is all going to happen is all of these are going to collapse into a GST. Of course, GST has its nuances, which is that it could be an interstate GST or it could be a central GST, etc. But principally what will happen is all of these taxes would be able to be offset one against the other, which therefore means that there is no multiple layering of taxes as a result of which the benefit will go off finally to the consumer. We hope that there will be no increase in prices as a result of GST coming in. But that is essentially what it's going to be. That's having said that, that's one which is very good. I think the larger challenge is going to be the implementation of it. Because for the first time, we are seeing the government is more ready than what the industry is. And the industry may not be ready, perhaps, because we always thought that GST would not come into force. But now it's reality from July 1. Bills have been passed. Rates have been fixated. So therefore, the industry is in a catch-up mode, whether it's from a technology, whether it's implementation, whether it's trying to understand. But if all of this falls into place the way it should, then I think it's a complete game changer. So thank you for that. Uh, let me just move on to uh, Arun very quickly. You've already given a good idea of what you're doing in your park. What is holding up large-scale investments in your park? Or any park like this, I'm not particularly there is obviously a reluctance of foreign investors to come into SEZ parks. You've got land, you've got everything, you've got a name of Tata's behind it, and still, it is, where is the reluctance? There are two things. One, uh, when you look at uh, large-scale industries coming into parks, I think we are uh, unnecessarily focusing uh, having a big industry. You know, our vision of big industry, either you look at it, a billion-dollar-wise size industry or acreage-wise size industry, or employment by size industry. Which one is a big industry? That we need to make a focus on. If I have acquired land and I have to generate employment, then you look at employment generation per acre wise as a size of the industry, not how many billion dollars have come in. If that be the case, in that case, in my mind, uh, not the big industries are not the major employers. The, micro, the medium, small, or micro industries, MSMEs, are the ones who are the large scale employment providers and easier to attract. Somehow our FDI laws or even state level laws are still not, you know, made all that friendly for giving uh, land or giving benefits to the MSMEs. Everything is still geared towards getting a big fish into the pool. But if you look at all the MSMEs together, they can make the ecosystem on which then the bigger companies can come. If I talk to a Boeing to come and make a factory in my factory, my area, the first thing he says is we don't have ecosystem there. True. So instead of running after the bigger ones, develop the ecosystem of the smaller ones first, bring in some small precision engineering industries. Then I cluster. Clustering. Do those clusterings. And I think that approach will help. And there the state level uh, acts or laws need to be modified to help the MSMEs. Uh, we've talked a lot about what DBS has done. So I won't go back into that. But there is a big story on Digital India. And there is a big story that you are writing on Digibank and your plans, and you've obviously been quite successful in the first first year. So can you quickly give us a sense of how the Digibank plans and the Digital India plans and the payment systems that are going on, how do they uh, all, all tie up together? So I think the f fact that we chose India, there were some fairly unique characteristics about the India digital environment which are worth repeating. I think the government has created two clear differentiators which we should keep in mind. One is a whole system of authentication and central record keeping, which allows businesses to perform what I would call on-demand authentication of individuals and now moving to companies. I think it's a very important open architecture system, which is a huge enabler. And that is the primary reason why we chose India as the first market for Digibank. 
I would like to take this uh, opportunity to thank all the speakers who joined in and uh, Mr. Garija Pandey for anchoring both the sessions, in fact. And it, it was great listening to you, sir, as usual. I'd like to thank all our sponsors, uh, DBS, Gapalpur Industrial Park and Special, and organizations like the High Commission of India and uh, IE Singapore for supporting this uh, initiative throughout. And it's also my uh, privilege to thank the organizations SPF, Ad India, Singtel, and the IDS for their contribution. And uh, look forward to meeting you all for the next year's India Emerging Forum uh, in 2018. Thank you. Actually, it is interesting that there is a lot of connectivity between India and Singapore today. Uh, we often say there are over 6,000 Indian companies headquartered uh, uh, in Singapore for not just the Asian operations, sometimes for their uh, international operations. Uh, conversely, there is significant Singapore investment in India, in the port, in the airline, in the bank, in the telco, in the power sector, in uh, property, and so on and so forth. Uh, one thing that could uh, be improved though is even better quality of personal relationships and ties among people that matter. Uh, the policy setters, the leadership, a degree of familiarity with how each system works and how to make the elephant dance. Uh, as far as investment in India is concerned, this is perhaps the most opportune moment and Government of India has initiated a lot many initiatives for making uh, life easier for doing business and it's at this point of time that Tata still comes with this promise of 3,000 acres of development for uh, you know, kind of things where we can have a multi-product uh, special economic zone and we are providing the world-class opportunities and this is the right moment to get into India and Tata still stands by its promise of providing with the best best way to get in there. Air India is very proud to be associated with the Times Now uh, event in Singapore. This has been the third year in succession and uh, we are hoping that you will have a wonderful year ahead and a wonderful chapter next. Thank you.